Hey guys, so welcome to the pre-lab. In next week's lab, we're going to be examining how certain molecules can have an effect on the heart rate. So to do that, we need to know a little bit more about the way that hearts function. So what do we know about hearts? We know that they contain contractile cells, and we're going to learn a little bit more about the timing of heartbeats so that we, we know that the heart will contract in a certain rhythm. We know that certain things can speed up or slow down that rhythm. We're going to be learning more about how that's controlled at the molecular level. And a mystery that we'll never solve is why I don't have one. So again, we'll be learning more about contractile cells and how they receive a signal to contract. How do they know when to do this? So we have contractile cells, which as you suspect, contain myosin and actin, but this will also involve a second type of cell called a pacemaker cell, whose job it is to help the contractile cells keep time. So we're gonna be talking about the two different types of cells separately, but I wanna start with the contractile cells. So we'll be looking at exactly how they know when to contract, and then looking at where that signal comes from. So part one, contractile cells. So in order to understand this, we can relate this quite a bit to how an action potential occurs in neurons. So thinking about the resting potential inside of a cell, which will remain at a slightly negative charge relative to the outside. So we learned in our lecture videos that this is at least in part due to the action of the sodium potassium pump. So we know that that contributes to the resting potential. But let's look at these molecules. So a resting cell is negatively charged inside relative to the outside of the cell. There's a lot going on here, but let's just kind of pay attention to one ion at a time. So our green ions are sodium ions. And we know that the sodium outside the cell is going to be greater than the concentration of sodium inside the cell. Thus our concentration gradient wants these ions to move outward. They can't diffuse through the membrane because they're charged and they have channels, but in a resting cell, these channels are closed. The sodium may want to go in, but it actually cannot. So now let's look at the potassium. So our potassium's yellow, okay, and the potassium outside the cell is actually gonna be less than the potassium inside the cell in a resting cell. However, these potassium channels stay open. So we can actually move with our concentration gradient and we can go out of the cell. So it's like these are pumped in and can circle right back out. Okay, so this is gonna be a way to contribute to the negative resting potential in the cell. So how are these positive charges distributed? So again, there's a lot going on here and there's a lot of motion. These ions kind of flow back and forth. Potassium continuously trying to leave the cell through these open channels. Sodium, which would want normally to go into the cell, cannot, so we trap it on the outside. This means that there are more positive ions on the outside of the cell and less on the inside. So this is going to also help account for the negative charge in a resting cell. So this negative 90 millivolts, negative 70, depending on the type of cell that we're looking at, this is going to be our resting potential. So now let's get ready to contract. Okay, so we know that contractile cells will receive a signal when it's time to contract. This signal will come from the pacemaker cells, but we haven't talked about how the pacemaker cell will generate that yet. We're only gonna focus on what happens in the contractile cell when it receives the signal. At this time, that's all you need to focus on. So once this occurs, we get a stimulus, it's time to contract. We need to pay attention to what's gonna happen to these sodium channels. So when a stimulus is received, the bolted gate gated ion channels are going to open. And remember that sodium this whole time wanted to go into the cell. Now is its chance. So these ions will rush into the cell. 
once they're in the cell, this really helps spike up that potential so they'll end up with a more positive charge inside the cell. So these open and sodium can rush in. So that's gonna to contribute to that first peak. Okay, so now once this happens, there's also just more sodium. Not only is the cell positive inside now, but there's also just more sodium ions to be found. And it turns out that this is going to affect our site of calcium storage within the cell. So if we remember, calcium is stored within the smooth ER, the specialized type of smooth ER called the sarcoplasmic reticulum in our contractile cells. We get ready to open them. Again, the sodium triggering the open of these calcium channels, so the opening of these channels, and calcium can then also go out into the cytoplasm. And that's going to prolong the amount of time that we have a positive charge in the cell. And it's also going to directly contribute to our ability to perform a contraction. So, so far, what's happened, we have allowed sodium to come into the cell. That has increased the overall charge inside the cell to a positive charge. And we've opened up calcium channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, allowing calcium out into the cytosol. So in contractile cells, again, let's remember what this will do for a muscle contraction. So we reviewed the general basics of muscle contractions that are dependent on actin and myosin in our week three, part one lecture video. But now let's go ahead and add on the role of calcium. So to add on the role of calcium, we need to remember we've got our actin filament. And myosin's not pictured, but we know that it's just below wanting to bind to certain sites on this actin. Now we don't want to be continuously contracted. That's not a thing that we really want to experience. What we want to be able to do is control when it's relaxed and when it's contracted. So in a cell that should not be contracting, that is resting, we have physical ways of blocking those myosin binding sites. So this would be through the combined action of tropomyosin. You can think of it kind of, it's more of a rope-like structure, so like ropomyosin and troponin. Okay, so we've got our troponin complex. On our troponin complex, there are little sites where calcium can actually attach. So when we do get ready to contract, all that calcium that was recently freed from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's now in the cytosol, can attach to our troponin. This causes the whole troponin, tropomyosin sort of complex to just move out of the way exposing those myosin binding sites. So at this time, myosin can attach to these binding sites. We can go through that whole cycle of our power stroke. We can contract, fully contract the sarcomere, or this actin myosin complex. And whenever we get finished, the calcium can be pulled back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is what we'll see on the next slide. So we've actually gone through several stages of this. So we've seen that increase, which initially sodium ions flowing into the cell is a large part of this increase. And then this sort of prolonged situation, which is in part due to calcium, okay, can also be in part due to some actions of the potassium channels, but for now, we're ready to reset. So our potassium channels in our resting cell, if we remember these will remain open, our sodium channels close. At this time, no more sodium can come into the cell and potassium is free to leave. In addition, the sodium potassium pump will continue to reset all of these ions so that we continue down into this resting potential again. So again, we've covered a lot of this action with ions. We've covered in our previous lecture videos the way that muscle cells contract with actin and myosin, and now we've added calcium 
to the situation. So this is all been exactly what happens in a contractile cell. Okay, so we understand that when a signal is received, we start all of this chain reaction into a, a contraction, a, an action potential. Okay, so the next thing we have to understand is where does that signal come from? What is it that triggers this initial influx of sodium ions? And to understand that, we need to move up a step and understand the function of a type of cell called a pacemaker cell. So pacemaker cells help to signal contractile cells to be on time. So that initial sodium influx that starts off the contraction is due to signals received by neighboring pacemaker cells. They are effectively there to tell these contractile cells when to be. So there's a lot about these cells, these pacemaker cells, that's similar to a contractile cell, but there are some things that are different too. So let's look at the differences. So we've got our standard issue, closed up sodium channel, our open potassium channel, but we're gonna add to that picture a different kind of sodium channel and calcium channels on the surface. So you can see I've colored these a little bit differently. These are kind of a more ghosty green relative to the regular sodium channels. And then our calcium channels are blue. So what's special about these? These channels you may notice are just a little bit open right now. These are what are referred to as leaky channels and they do exactly what it sounds like. These leaky channels allow sodium to gently trickle in and calcium to gently trickle in. And if we remember that this elevated number of positive ions in the cytosol really triggers all of these things, all of these action potentials, these downstream actions, it hopefully is starting to make sense why allowing positive ions to slowly trickle into the cell will eventually elicit an action potential. And that's exactly what will happen. And so you can actually see, we don't have a true resting potential in these cells. Instead of these leaky channels, which are kind of pictured down here, um, they actually allow ions to slowly, slowly, slowly come in until we reach a certain threshold, action potential. And this would be where the contractile cells are informed. And you notice we don't fully reset we just start that slow trickle all the way over again. So you can see why this would be rhythmic. This is sort of like an hourglass, except much, much faster. So we like trickle in, reach a threshold. This would be a contraction, then start that again. Okay, so these ions, once they've reached that threshold and we have that action potential in our pacemaker cells, that information is actually communicated to contractile cells through gap junctions. So we now understand that through these leaky channels, we're able to control the timing in a rhythmic way. And of course, there are things that can affect how much calcium, how much sodium can get in at a particular time. There are things that can affect how quickly this is going to occur so that we can change the rate based off of our environment but we know that this will trigger a contraction in the contractile cells, giving us a regular heartbeat. So we've learned in this video that certain molecules have the ability to affect the rate at which the heart beats. So this could include epinephrine, which you may also know as adrenaline, and a molecule called adenosine. So in the next lab, we'll be adding adenosine or epinephrine to a creature called Daphnia magna, which is also referred to as a water flea to see its effect on the heart. We're gonna be using these Daphnia because they're great models to see the heart because their carapace is see-through. We can actually just look right through it and find the heart. So I'll see you in the next video where we'll review the Daphnia protocol.